second here. All right. So welcome to our program this evening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Bob Bruner. I am the A&R Extension Educator for Clay and Owen Counties in Indiana. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the area, uh, that is relatively close to Bloomington and Terre Haute, Indiana. I'm kind of in between the two of those. Um, I am an entomologist. I've been an entomologist for about 12 or 13 years now. Um, and I, I actually have a little bit of a unique experience with the periodical cicada. So when I was a freshman at Purdue, just getting started on learning entomology, that was the last year the periodical cicada emerged. And um, I had some, kind of, some fun, so to speak, with these things because uh, walking around campus on Purdue, I would occasionally get smacked by them. And uh, me being a kid back then who didn't know insects very well, like you guys, I was kind of terrified of what just happened to me when one of those things would fly right into me. But I can safely tell you uh, with some experience behind me, these are not any kind of threat to you or your family or your pets. We just have to worry a little bit about some of our tree species and what these insects might represent for them. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you all to stay muted for the duration of the program. Go ahead and put your questions and anything you want to say in the chat. I promise I am reading it, and I'll try to address everything at the end of the program. Now, this program you're seeing tonight is a part of an initiative that our entomology department is doing in conjunction with our extension educators. So you can see on this first slide here, this was created by Ashley Adair. She is my county uh, counterpart in Montgomery County. That's where Crawfordsville, Indiana is. And uh, all the credit for this information goes to her. I, can't, I didn't make any of this. This is all her work and we're really happy she was willing to share it with us. So let's dive into some information on cicadas. Cicadas are a part of a really large, really unique group. So we usually refer to these as hemiptera. That's a, a classification known as order. So if you went to school and you learned a funny mnemonic that kind of went king, fill up, does this, that, and the other, that talks about kingdom, phylum, class, order, species, et cetera, um, that's that order classification. Hemiptera means half wing because a lot of the insects in this group have half of their wing leathery and the other half membranous. However, cicadas are a part of a subgroup within Hemiptera. They have completely membranous wings. Now, the thing that separates all of these insects out from insects that aren't a part of Hemiptera is that they all have piercing, sucking mouth parts. What that means is that instead of mouth parts that will chew or rip apart plants, they have something kind of like a syringe that they will poke into either leaf tissue or maybe a prey item, and they'll put in digestive uh, juices that'll break down that material, and then they'll basically drink it up. Um, cicadas are particularly unique in this group because they do have this tendency where they do have different broods that are separated by several years, but they also have an annual variety that we see every year. Now, one of the things that you're seeing here on this slide is a close-up of the organ that is going to start driving you crazy in just a little bit here. This organ is called a timbal, and they are able to vibrate this organ to extraordinarily loud decibel levels. Um, I, sometimes I've heard people like my wife refer to this as when the trees start screaming every year, and really she is not that far wrong with that opinion. All right, so the life cycle of cicada is, like I said, one of the more interesting ones. Now, these guys use what's referred to as incomplete metamorphosis. So a butterfly has complete metamorphosis where they'll hatch from an egg, they'll be a caterpillar, they'll form a cocoon, and then they'll hatch out of the cocoon as the adult butterfly. Cicadas have incomplete metamorphosis. When they hatch out of their egg, they're just going to become this kind of very small, kind of undefined version of their adult. And the middle image here shows you what that looks like. This is referred to as a nymph. This nymph will have little wing pads that you could see kind of where its shoulders are, and they'll eventually develop into wings on their last molt. And then you could see what the adult looks like in the right-hand image. The left-hand image is really interesting, I think, too, because that shows you a close-up of their eggs and where those eggs are located. The adults will carve out a portion of a tree just barely into the limb, and they will lay their eggs in that portion right there. 
So this is just kind of showing what you could see when these guys end up molting into their adult form. So the left image is showing you the fully adult cicada hatching out of its immature form. These immatures will crawl up onto trees or uh, large plants that are on the ground. Basically, they're trying to get away from predators because they're pretty helpless. And that process of actually going through what's referred to as ecdysis, when they hatch out and uh, molt into an adult form, is really, really dangerous to them. Their bodies are very, very soft. Oftentimes, they don't even survive the ecdysis process itself because it's very traumatic. It can easily tear their bodies when they're that soft. And one thing you can also do too is you can look for the empty shells that are going to be hanging from tree limbs and other plants. And we, were, we entomologists refer to this as the exuvia. And you can actually find these every year with our annual cicadas and kids will collect them and they'll, they, they can actually keep these things will last forever because they're made of a material called chitin, which makes up the exoskeleton of insects. It's very tough and it's very difficult for anything to break down. And just one thing I wanted to point out too with that left image is you could see that you don't really see full wings on it. Well, what's going on is that yellow protrusion from the shoulders of this insect, those are the wings. And what they'll do is they'll push fluid pressure into those wings through their veins and they'll unfurl kind of like you're blowing air into a, a balloon. And then once they've had time to harden their exoskeleton, they'll actually be what you expect to see. So there are a few differences between our annual and our periodical cicadas. One of the biggest ones that I want to point out to all of you is the time of year. They do differ, differ in the time of year that you're going to see them. Periodical cicadas we're going to see now. Our annual cicadas are going to appear later in the summer. One of the ways you could tell them apart, though, is their coloration is very different. Um, our annual cicadas are, are this green color that have dark eyes and they're also going to be larger. Whereas the periodical cicada is going to be smaller, maybe three quarters to one and one quarter of an inch. They're going to have these orange colors on their wings where the veins are, and their eyes are also going to be bright red. You can even see that bright red color in the eyes of the immature insects. So they're very easy to differentiate between the, our normal annual and our periodical or brood X cicadas. And here's just the, something that they're pointing out here. The way they sound is going to be a lot different too. So I am not going to subject you guys to me trying to imitate that sound. I'm going to have a little mercy on you this evening. But what you could do is you can look up on YouTube and find a lot of these sounds that are recorded so you can actually tell the difference. Um, one thing they point out here with our periodical cicadas, that as a group, they'll sound like a UFO. Um, I thought this was funny because I would love to know which of our entomologists figured out what a UFO sounds like, but I will take their word for it. Um, but what you can do is you could tell that there's a difference in the pattern of their sounds. That um, our annual cicada is going to have a sound that'll be like a buzzing that'll slowly rise to a higher pitch and then drop off. Whereas the periodical cicada is going to be this two-part sound that's going to drop off a little bit as it reaches kind of the end as though they were pronouncing the word pharaoh and elongating it. Now here's a little bit more about the timing. So for our annual cicadas, they're going to start coming out of the ground around mid to late summer, so July and August. Basically, as soon as most of your fairs are over with, you are probably going to see the annual brood of cicadas coming out of the ground. Whereas our periodical cicadas, they are actually coming out of the ground now and have been for several weeks. So mid-April through late May. And what they're doing there is they're waiting for those soil temperatures to reach 65 degrees Fahrenheit or above. Because that is going to be what they use to figure out, okay, is it warm enough now for me to be able to survive outside? It's also when the temperatures are actually warm enough for them to become more active because lower temperatures than that means they're going to enter into their version of hibernation, where they just go dormant and feed only a little bit. Uh, they're going to emerge at night to avoid predators. 
And one of the easy ways to tell if they've emerged, and I was talking to a few of you before the program about it, is you can look for the signs of their presence on the ground. And I have a few pictures that I should have in a moment here to show you what that'll look like. So this is just a little bit of an example of what they do, why, how they actually operate in our world. So the image on the left, this was taken by John Obermeyer, who's an entomologist of a significant amount of experience at Purdue University. He's showing you what it looks like when they lay their eggs, those strips taken out of the branch of this tree. That's actually where the insect has laid its eggs. What they use is this organ called an ovipositor. And what this is, is it's kind of a sword shaped organ um, where it's basically a tube or a straw and it's connected to the female's egg chamber in her body. And she'll basically push the eggs out of her body through this ovipositor to wherever their final destination will be. In this case, they'll use their ovipositor to cut into the branch a very short ways and lay the eggs into that furrow she's made. Now our other image is actually showing you what the nymphs will do when they're feeding. They're going to attack and damage the roots of trees. Now, I have yet to find a tree death that has really been linked to cicada presence. They just aren't really heavily damaging to a lot of our trees when it comes down to it. If we're worried about insects feeding on trees, there are a lot of other insects that I would be concerned with first before cicadas really came up on my radar. But they do damage. They can help spread disease. So they could create a situation where fungal diseases could enter root systems. Um, though they, again, they aren't nearly as threatening as other insects or other organisms will be to your trees. All right, so we go here a little bit more into what it's going to look like as they lay their eggs. So they're going to lay them on branches and twigs that are going to be between 3 16 and 7 16 in diameter. So basically slightly wider than a pencil. Uh, they're going to lay anywhere between 400 and 600 eggs. Now, that sounds like a lot, and it is. But the thing is, is that cicadas have a very high attrition rate. What this means is that they are fairly defenseless when they're young. They don't have any really good means of defending themselves at all. Um, the tree will offer some protection for the eggs, but when they hatch out, they have to crawl down the tree and get into the ground, which means they're going to be subject to a lot of predators. So the female cicada is hedging her bets that if she lays a huge number of eggs, at least a few of her offspring are going to survive. Ultimately, what this is going to mean for us, though, is that as she damages the tree by laying her eggs, your younger, smaller trees are going to be more at risk for heavier damage. So the question I see a lot is that people will ask, why do they wait 17 years? Well, there are a few different reasons for this. Um, one of them that's not necessarily described in the slide is that they're trying to avoid interaction with a lot of other insects that they're gonna be competing for resources. The other thing is, is that if they do a very heavy investment in all of their next generation all at once, when that generation comes back out of the ground, they're going to be able to overwhelm their predators and their other competitors. And basically, as they've adapted these traits over time, they just keep reinvesting into that until it's built to this 17-year period now, where we know reliably they will come out of the ground at that rate, and they will just have millions upon millions of young. Um, I think the, the estimation that's shown later in this presentation says that um, there will be about a million and a half cicadas for every acre within a woodlot, potentially, if there have been cicadas there before. So they will be very overwhelming in some areas. Another question that I get quite a bit, and this is one I've had to address for myself too, is that will our pets eat cicadas? And the answer is, oh yes, they will very much eat cicadas. Um, the, remember, our dogs, they are omnivores and they're primarily predators, so they will consume anything they find that's alive or dead, and cicadas certainly fit that bill, and there will be plenty of them there. I would advise you to keep your pets away from cicadas. So while they are not directly damaging, um, the trouble is, is that 
that exoskeleton on a cicada is extremely hard to digest. Uh, there are only a few organisms in our world that are actually able to digest chitin, the material these exoskeletons are made of. And those are usually like snails and slugs. Your dog's stomach is not going to be able to handle them very well. So keep your pets away from them so that way you can avoid the upset stomach. Um, you probably don't need to worry about a vet visit because most likely the dog is just going to get sick and he'll get rid of everything in his stomach anyways, as many dog owners are very familiar with. So just keep your pets away from them. Save yourself some trouble. So we in Indiana are lucky in a certain way. Um, we have perhaps one of the greatest concentrations of, cica of periodical cicadas in the country. Uh, every single county in Indiana is going to have a significant cicada population come up. Um, and this is going to be true whether you're up near the Great Lakes or whether you're down nearby the Ohio River. We are going to be primarily dominated by this brood, Brood X, our 17-year cicada. Though there are a few other broods that have different year intervals that are going to appear, but they're going to be at different areas of the state. The big thing to understand there is just that our 17-year is going to be everywhere. And when you start hearing cicadas this summer, the first cicadas you're going to hear will be brood X. So here's just a table that Purdue put together um, on our different cicada broods throughout the state. Now, the one that you're looking at here is the one labeled as brood X or brood 10. These are Roman numerals in this case. And they're a part of the 17-year race. Now, there's multiple 17-year races you could see on this table. And you can also see when they're going to appear. So we not only have the ones appearing this year, but we'll have another one in two years of a different kind of subset of the generation, another one in 2024. And then you could see there's also one that's going to happen in 2034 as well. And if you remember the last time these came up, 17 years ago, so what we are seeing is that same brood back when I was a freshman at Purdue. Now they are going to, like it says here, they will be heaviest in south central Indiana. So where I'm at in Owen County, uh, Brown County, will probably just get inundated with these things. And the surrounding areas and around there are going to be very, very heavy. It, like if you live anywhere near Morgan Monroe State Forest, get some ear buffs because you are going to be hearing it. Trust me. Now you can also see here that the other broods, they point out where they're going to occur. So you can see here that they're going to be uh, one of our 17 years, the 2024 version of them is going to primarily be in northern Indiana around Lake LaPorte and Porter counties. Whereas the 2025 version of these things are going to be heavier in southwest counties and they're going to expect more of them in Brood and Warwick, or I'm sorry, Brown and Warwick counties. So there will be some differentiation between the different years and where they're going to be located. So I love this image because I have yet to successfully get pictures of the chimneys these things make. So what you're seeing here it, are the evidence that these have come out of the ground. Some of you were actually asking about this earlier. So on the bare dirt spot in the uh, picture on the left, you could see the clear holes where these have come out of the ground. And if you look carefully towards the top of the picture, you can actually see a cicada right there. And th this is the evidence that they have been there and that they have started, excuse me, started coming out of the ground. Now the right image I really like because I had one of these brought in to me. I actually had several of these brought to me. This is what we refer to when we talk about a chimney. This ball of dirt will actually come right off of the ground and it'll look just like that. It'll look like a ball of dirt that just has this funny kind of pencil sized hole in it. That's where the cicada was, where it dug out the ground and it just kind of filled in behind it as they came out of the ground. This is the evidence that you're looking for to know are cicadas present here? Do I have to uh, start looking for these things on my trees? Now there is some good news when it comes to cicadas and I've talked about this at a touch here. Cicadas will not harm us. They are incapable of biting us. While they do have piercing sucking mouth parts, they can't orient their heads in such a way to really stab us. They're not even gonna try to test bite us. They are very reliant on the species of trees that are around us. Now, the thing that um, I pointed out a little bit ago too, young trees and shrubs are going to be at highest risk. 
Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to cover all your shrubs because um, cicadas are going to go for the best environment they can get to first, but they will be present potentially on them. And you need to keep an eye on these things. You need to monitor them. That's the biggest thing I'm gonna suggest is if you're worried about things like your rose shrubs or other things like we were talking about earlier, start your monitoring. Don't immediately cover them yet. You want those things to still get pollinated and to get sunlight, but monitor so you know when to cover them. So here, and I saw somebody asking about this, you were asking what species are we gonna have to look for these things on? Here are the species we most expect them to be on. And this is a fairly large list, a fairly comprehensive one, but this doesn't mean that it is all of them. So we expect to see these on trees as common as maples, redbud, dogwood, um, ash. They're going to hit any living ash trees that you have. Uh, and there are lots of other ones that I know I've seen without throughout my area, hawthorn, service berries in our area, chestnut, I've seen a few in my area. Crab apple and apple trees will also be at risk. So for those of you who are really worried about covering things up, if you have an orchard, you need to start thinking about this. Um, they'll also hit cherries, peaches, and plums, and of course, oak. Now, uh, for those of you who live in Indiana, and I'm sure a lot of you who are just outside of the state, you can barely swing a cat without hitting an oak tree, to steal a phrase. So um, don't swing a cat, by the way. So they're going to be very, very common throughout a lot of our trees. And of course, you can see on here, they're gonna appear on roses. So you're gonna wanna monitor your roses as well. Like I said, this is not a comprehensive list, but this does mean that you can expect to find live cicadas and egg laying activity on these species. These are ones that we know they will definitely go to. So again, do your monitoring, keep your eyes open and just prepare, be prepared with netting um, there are some pesticides you can attempt to apply, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit, but I really want you guys to focus on that monitoring effort. So what can you do? And this is where uh, you want to consider covering the trees. Now, the great thing is cicadas are big, so you don't need a very, very tiny mesh to cover them. You can get away with something like a half inch mesh screening to be able to prevent them, but you want to make sure that you only do your pruning efforts after the flight is over with. Don't remove your dead limbs or anything like that until that flight is done with. And that'll only last until about midsummer or so. And then if you're going to apply insecticide, there are a few suggestions they make here. Um, some from the permethrin group like spectricide, bug stop, and eight or Cyfluthrin, BioAdvance is one of the uh, product names that you can find this under. Primarily, if you're gonna focus on insecticide efforts, look for products that have permethrin or Cyfluthrin in them. So when it comes down to um, how to apply these, the big thing that I want you guys to focus on here is to follow the label. Most of these are going to be sprayable pesticides or mists. So that means that there is a potential for you spraying something where you don't intend it to go. And remember, a pet, an insecticide, it does not have any friends. It's going to hit any insect that it comes into contact with. So that means our pollinators, our uh, potential beneficial insects will also be impacted by this. If you do choose to apply, you're gonna reapply about every five to seven days during the flight trunk to foliage. So you're trying to aim there because they're going to be covering the tree. They won't just stick in the branches. You might find some in the trunk and that way you can also get them when they hatch out and crawl down the trunk too. So again, follow that label. And while it says here, reapply every five to seven days, make sure you consult the label on that too. Some labels may be different. You're going to want to follow the label because that's going to be the law. All right, for those of you who are worried about reforestation plantings, um, most likely the sites that have existed since 2004 are going to be at risk. Those are the sites where the cicadas rose on their last flight and they went back into the ground in that same area because there's a woodlot right there that they could take advantage of. Now, new plantings will not be killed. The trees are only going to lose the growth from this year and most likely they will recover. 
And that's what we commonly see with even our annual cicadas. Remember, we do get these every year and our trees still recover okay. Um, they are currently recommending to avoid using pesticides and reforestation. And I very much agree with this. Um, the risk of damaging beneficial insects and other insects that you're going to want like pollinators is just far too high. So I would simply just monitor the area, um, kind of keep track of things, maybe mark down what trees have been the most heavily damaged and then wait a year, come back and take a look and see what's happened. Most likely the trees will recover. And this also goes for those of you who are, uh, have like significant woodlots on your property. This is the same advice that I would give to you. Don't panic, just monitor, keep track of the trees that seem the most heavily damaged and then take a look next year, see if they leaf out. You gotta kind of take the long-term view with it. All right, so when it comes to nursery crops, you're gonna want to avoid planting new trees and shrubs the fall before a periodical cicada emergence. So unfortunately, this is information is coming to you uh, coming to you a little late because you would want to have taken this action that fall before. Now, some of you were asking me earlier, should I plant things now? Um, I'm gonna stick with the advice I gave earlier, monitor first. If your plants are healthy and large, like if you're just moving them from pot to ground, I wouldn't panic yet because that means they're probably fairly strong. But if they're younger plants, then yes, I would be hesitant to plant them, at least not without some kind of mesh screening like that half inch mesh, mesh they're suggesting here. Remember to prune only after the cicada flight is over. And of course they're making the suggestion of applying insecticides if some of your nursery crops are more at risk. So what can you apply on fruit? Um, they suggest products with Espen Valorate. So under the product label Asana XL, there are also other products that are gonna have Espen Valorate on it. Uh, Bifenthrin, Cyfluthrin, Deltamethrin, and Permethrin are all suggestions too. Um, these will have good effect and they should not last super long on your fruit. So they will have a short residual and hopefully not do too much harm to the insects that you want helping you. And again, they're just making that suggestion every five to seven days uh, during the flight, trunk to foliage, and then do your application when the emergence starts. So if you have an orchard right now, and you haven't started applying yet, um, as soon as the weather stabilizes a little bit temperature wise, you might wanna make that consideration to get moving on um, doing your applications there. All right, so that was a fairly short one. Uh, we only went for about a half an hour there. So thank you guys for listening. Uh, and we got some contact information for some bug questions here. I also wanna mention again, I'm an entomologist. If you have additional questions after this evening's program, please feel free to contact me. Um, you guys all have my email at this point and I love answering questions on bugs. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording.